Okay, let's go to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. So if you remember what we're looking at, we're looking at the final stage, what theologians call the eternal state. After the millennial reign, when Jesus sets up the kingdom on earth, he's also going to um, bring a new heavens and a new earth, and he's going to reveal that out of heaven, uh, the new heavens with a new earth, and he reveals certain things that we've been looking at that are going to be in the new Jerusalem in the new heavens and the new earth. So I'm not going to go over all that again. We did look at that last time. Um, but certain things we do have to focus on because they keep getting repeated. And we looked at the things that God keeps re-emphasizing at the end, which are uh, a renewal of what God created at the beginning. And we're going to look at one of those again tonight that we've looked at before, but we're going to look at it in a slightly different way, as we said last time. So let's read the first couple of verses. So, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Okay, just stop there a moment. Actually, just go to verse 9 of the same chapter. So we've already looked at this, but we need to look at it again because it keeps repeating in the next two chapters. And so I'm going to try and look at it thematically rather than just uh, verse by verse because each verse keeps repeating the same thing that we're looking at. So one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride the wife of the lamb. So it's very clear what's happening now is that there is an emphasis on the revelation of the bride. Yeah? I know we've already looked at this, but we need to look at it again. Um, now, there it says, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Now, we might just read that and think, well, well, so what? But if you remember, which you probably won't, but if you can remember when we looked at chapter 17, can you go to chapter 17 of Revelation and verse 1? This is important because it's showing us something. Because this isn't the first time this angel's shown John something. So, so this is going way back to before the millennium. So he's going in, in his vision way back a thousand years prior. And what does it say? One of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and said to me, so it's the same angel. Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. So if you remember... A thousand years before in the vision, it's not a thousand years because it's a vision, but this angel shows John and states, look, I'm going to show you something. Come with me, I want to show you something. If an angel says, come with me, I want to show you something, it's pretty important, yeah? So this angel has already showed to John a woman, but not the bride, a prostitute or harlot, which is the opposite of a bride, yeah? And what happens to this bride? This bride is wearing scarlet and purple, and she's the epitome of everything that is wicked. She's the mother of all harlots, the abominations of the earth, all sinful immorality, everything, perversion, um, uh, idolatry, everything is in this woman, Yeah? So remember that. So when the angel, the same angel, now comes to John in chapter 21, he's saying, come, I will now show you another woman. Not that one. The good one. Remember the book of Revelation is a picture of, the, it's of a wedding. It's the revelation, the apocalypto, the re which literally means removing of the veil. It's a picture of the coming wedding. So it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, but then at the grand climax, at the, at the crescendo of revelation, which is now where we are, the angels say, now come, I will show you. And he keeps saying, I'm going to show you the bride. Remember, John's already seen Jesus. He's already seen the lamb. He's already seen Christ. That's 
been mentioned many times throughout Revelation. So now he's taking us to see this picture. So go back to chapter 21 and verse 9. So John's like, ah, right. Now I saw everything that were rubbish. I saw the evil religion, the evil system. Now I'm going to see the good one. It's interesting how you can often see bad stuff quicker than you can see good stuff. Have you ever noticed that? You ever noticed it's easy to see bad stuff in people? Well, God wants us to see the good. You'll hear people tell you all bad stuff about the church. Remember, the harlot is an evil religious system. It is real. It is there. It's around us. But Jesus is looking at the bride. Okay, so now the angel is saying... Remember, it's the same angel who destroyed the previous bride, the seven bowls of the seven last plagues. The angel got rid. She was punished, burned with fire. Now, the new bride, the, the, the new bride, the, the only bride, the good bride, not the, not the harlot, is going to be revealed. So we're going to look at that uh, in some detail. Uh, I'm going to show you some stuff that you've not, we've not looked at before. I know you may have read my book and we've done studies on the bride, but I'm going to try and show you some things that perhaps we've not looked at before because this is the grand climax of the book of Revelation. Okay, so are you all up for this? Yeah, yeah we want to look at this woman, yeah? yeah? We want to look at the most perfect woman who has ever lived, except you, darling, who has ever <laughs> been created in all existence, yeah? Now... What's first thing? What's the first thing this woman's called? She's called a bride, yeah? Obvious. But there's different words for your woman, isn't there? Your wife, your fiancé, your, your girlfriend. Ah, lass. <laughs> some, some people. And so in, in the Greek, there's lots of different words as well. Um, so the, the Greek word for wife, I think, is parthenos. You've heard of the Parthenon in, in Athens. Parthenos, it's, it's the word for wife. It was dedicated to the, to the, the gods or the, the wife of the gods. And um, another Greek word, which is usually translated... Well, sorry, Parthenos is actually the word for virgin properly. Um, the word for wife uh, is gyne. We still use it today, yeah? Gynecology. Women's issues. You know, stuff men don't know about. And we still use it. It's, it's the word for wife or sometimes woman, yeah? But the word for bride is different. That's why it's emphasized here. Um, the word for bride, in Hebrew it's different, but in, in, in Greek it's, uh, it's nympha, yeah? So nympha. It's, it's a specific word that's translated bride. So I just want us to try and look at this word, not all the other words, because there's words for wife and, you know, all these, um, but just this word, specific nympha, because it's not mentioned that much. It is mentioned, you know, enough for us to get a handle on what's happening. So let's look at this, just this word, nympha, not all the other words. So you remember Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he says, I espouse you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. So he's clearly talking uh, to the church in Corinth saying, um, you are a bride to Christ. But he doesn't use the word nympha, uh, chaste virgin, it's that word parthenos. Now, we know it sort of means the same thing, but, but God's very specific in the use of his words. So when he's using this word nympha, it very specifically means a bride, a woman who's getting married, right? A woman in her bridal garments a, a woman who is going to her wedding it's a woman who has a very specific purpose not just gyne woman in general or wife or virgin or all bridesmaids all these different words it's literally a bride yeah so let's look at this word then let's look at the first one can you just bring it down and so what does god mean by this word well the first thing that we need to understand about a bride is a bride belongs to a man. Would you all agree that? When a bride is coming to a wedding, she has already, already given herself to someone. She's not turning up hoping a bloke turns up that is all right. She, hopefully she already knows who he is. 
or she knows he's going to be there, or in some capacity, she's already betrothed, yeah? So this is mentioned in John's Gospel. Can we go there? John chapter 3 and verse 29. John chapter 3 and verse 29. So the Jewish nation knew Messiah was coming. Who's Messiah? The son of David, God's perfect man, yeah? And so people knew he was coming. So let's go there. So John the Baptist, this is John the Baptist speaking. What's he doing? He's baptizing people, getting them to repent, confessing their sins so that they're ready for when the Messiah comes. Yeah, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Messiah is coming, the Christ is coming, God's man is coming, yeah? But what does he call the people who are getting ready? He calls them the bride, Nympha. And so when, when the people came to John the Baptist and said, when Jesus arrived, and they said, do you know everyone's going to Jesus now, John? It's almost as if they, 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 they love Jesus more than you. Now, let me tell you something about preachers. They've got very, very uh, sensitive egos. They have. I, I met one once. And, and when you tell them they don't like your preaching, they prefer someone else's, it's like they can almost think their life is over. Well, what's the point of me existing then? You may as well go listen to them. But John the Baptist didn't. John the Baptist said, yeah, the bride belongs to the bridegroom, not me. The friend who attends the bridegroom, I'm, the, I'm like the best man. I'm the friend who attends the bridegroom. Right, the nympha, she, be, she doesn't belong to me. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. And he's here now. John the Baptist had already said that. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He just confessed that in the previous chapters. And so what does he say? The bridegroom waits and listens for him. Because in a Jewish wedding, the bridegroom, you know, was, was the one who came to the wedding. The bride was already here. And so... He is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. So it's very clear, the first mention of Nympha is, if you're the bride, which I hope you all here are a part of the bride, you belong to Jesus Christ, right? There might be others helping. John the Baptist was a great prophet. He was a friend of the bridegroom. There's other people helping you get ready, but you belong to him. You don't belong to anyone else. And I, I, you hear me stress over and over again, this is not my church. It's the church belongs to Jesus Christ. Yeah? We are just passing our ministry the best we can until Jesus comes or until he takes us away. Yeah? So what was John the doing? He was washing them, baptizing them, getting them clean, getting them repented. He's getting them ready for the wedding. Right? Because he knew that... This is the bride for when Jesus arrives. So Jesus did arrive. Okay, so that's first understanding. Let's go back to the chart then. Second understanding. We'll, and we're just looking at this word nympha. Guess how many times this word nympha occurs? Ooh. That might be a trick question. We'll see in a minute. Okay. Next thing we need to understand about the bride, in the biblical pattern, okay, the bride is removed, she's taken away. In the Jewish wedding, that's what happens. In the Jewish wedding, the bridegroom comes, snatches up the bride and takes, have you seen an officer and a gentleman? No, well, forget it then. Yeah, you've, seen, you've seen a Disney story, or you've seen... What happens? They come to catch the princess away, and they lift her up, and they run away into the sunset. You know, the dashing prince, you know, with his princess or whatever. It's, it's an archetype that's used throughout history. And it's because it's, we know there's something real about it within us. So if we go to Revelation 18, verse 23. Remember, we're just looking at Nympha. There's lots of other examples we could use about the woman being rescued and taken away, but just the word nympha, just in the New Testament. It's a different word in the Old Testament. Okay, so go to Revelation, where we, where we look there. Revelation 18, verse 23. 
So when the judgment comes on the world, yeah, and the harlot is judged, there's a strange thing that's said. When the judgment, it says that the light of a lamp will never shine on you again. The voice of the bride and the bridegroom will never be heard in you again. The judgment of God is there's no bride and bridegroom now. Understanding that that word bride in Revelation and only in the New Testament is always a reference to the church. In metaphor, but in literality, actually. So... When the judgment comes, God is saying, you'll never hear the bride again. You had your chance. The prostitute is judged. The, the wicked woman is judged. But the bride isn't heard. She's not there. Now, we've looked at that over and over again. But I just want us to see in these a few times that this word nympha is mentioned, right? Not the harlot. The harlot's still heard. She's being judged. But the true bride is not being judged. When the angel said to John, come, I will show you the bride, he takes him to heaven, to the high and holy mountain, to the new Jerusalem. When he shows the harlot, go to chapter 17 and verse Three. Remember, he says on both occasions, come, I will show you that that same angel, whether he's showing the, the bad woman, the prostitute, or whether he's showing the good woman, the bride, when he shows the bad woman, he says, the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. So the bad woman's in the desert, the true bride is coming out of heaven. The opposite of a desert is a paradise garden, you know, with flowing water and everything that we'll look at in the months to come about what heaven is a picture of. So we can see very clearly the distinction. Now, when the judgment comes, God says, you won't hear the bride again. There'll be no, there'll be no voice of the bride. There'll be no voice of the bridegroom. Because that you're now going into a desert. Remember, the wilderness is a, is a haunt of demons in the Bible. And that's exactly what Babylon the harlot becomes, a haunt of demons. That's what the wilderness is a picture of. Okay? So, the bride's removed. Let's go back to the chart then. Next thing about this word nympha, third time it's mentioned is the bride is expected to be ready. Now, that, again, these are obvious, really. Let's go there. Revelation 19 and verse 7. Revelation 19 and verse 7. Third time this word nympha crops up. And it tells us, we've just read in chapter 21, but we've already been told this previously in chapter 19. Let us rejoice and be, be glad... And give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride. So it's very clear once again, the bride belongs to the lamb. The lamb is Jesus Christ, as we've been told. The wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Remember the angel showed him the bad woman and she's dressed in all blasphemy and scarlet and self-indulgence. The pure bride is dressed in righteous acts and holiness linen bright and clean is given her to wear but the wedding has come she's already ready the true bride is ready now yeah if you're not ready now get ready now don't wait because you won't be get there's no warning for when god snatches up to meet him in the air there is no warning there's just a trumpet that's not a warning that's just a signal it's happening once that's happened, there's lots of warnings about lots of different things that will come, but not before that. That It's the doctrine of imminency. Jesus told us to be ready at every single opportunity. The wedding has come. The bride is caught away to the consummation. Okay, so let's go to the next time the word nympha is mentioned, time number four. And this is what we've just read in Revelation chapter 
21 and verse 2. So let's go there. Revelation 21 and verse 2. We've just read this. But I want us to see this word, the word nympha. We're looking at every time it's mentioned. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Right. Where's the bride coming from? Heaven. Yeah? She's already been taken to heaven. Yeah? She was on earth. She snatched away into heaven. Now at the end, because we're now at the eternal, she's coming out of heaven. Why is that important? Well, because a lot of people say that's not going to happen. A lot of Christians will say there is going to be no rapture. The bride is not going to be caught up to heaven. Well, she has to be because she's coming out of heaven. Plus all the other stuff we looked at. I'll not go into that. But this is a very important understanding. It's a very important theological concept. Let me explain something. You remember in Genesis chapter 6 that caused the destruction of earth, where the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful and took brides for them. It's not the word nympha because that's in Hebrew. Took wives for them, it actually says, of any of their chosen. Produced the Nephilim and the judgment was so severe, God had to destroy the earth in Noah's flood. Remember, Jesus said, as in the days of the Son of Man, so it will be, as in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Okay. What happened that caused that judgment? The son, the Benai Elohim, the sons of God, came down out of heaven to snatch women. Yeah? It's an important thing, this. In the Bible, when that immorality is talked about, let me give you an example. King David was on his house looking down and he saw Bathsheba. And it says he sent men down to get her. Yeah? This imagery of women is people in higher authority, the angels, or in that instance, King David, look down and say, I'll have that for me, for my gratification, for my lust. Yeah? At the end, God's bride, it's the opposite. She comes down. Not the angels, not the demons, not the fallen angels, not Satan himself who fell, not a king who's fallen into immorality. It's an important concept. Jesus does not come and get you out of lust. He lifts you up so that you have authority and so that you can come down. Instead of someone taking advantage over you, someone abusing you, he lifts you up so that you're the one who comes down. The bride comes down as a bride already with her husband. There's no abuse, there's no advantage, there's no uh, women being um, taken advantage of over here. It's the bride coming down out of heaven, not the other way around. This is why she has to be caught up to heaven. Right? That's why it's such an essential doctrine. Because if we're just here when all hell breaks loose on earth and comes upon us, we'll be abused just in the same way everyone else was abused, even in the times of Noah. No, it's we're coming down out of heaven. Okay, go to verse 9 then. So she's coming down out of heaven. It's that word nympha again. And then in verse 9, we read this. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, we've just read this, came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Now, this is so obvious, we can miss it. The angel wanted John to see the church. Do you? Because in my experience, a lot of Christians don't. What they see is their relationship with Jesus. What they see is their promises, their ambitions, their prophecies, their words, 
their Bible understanding, their ministry, their calling, their abilities, their gifting, and they never see what the church is. And God's plan is for the church to be everything. Everything God ever gives us is for the church to be built up. There's no such thing as someone's individual ministry for their fulfillment. There is no such thing in the Bible. And the angel, an angel is saying, look, you've got to see the bride. You've got to understand what the church is. If you don't get what the church is, you might believe in Jesus and then live a selfish life running after self-fulfillment, running all over the place trying to satisfy your own spiritual appetite. When God's plan is for you to be a part of his church, every ministry gift is given to the church, every spiritual gift is for the building up of the church, it's not for our own edification, right? We, we can be built up ourselves. Speaking in tongues will build yourself up, but God says excel in greater gifts so that the church is built up. And the angel's emphasis, and this is what's going to happen now in chapter 21 and 22, it's the revelation of what the church is. We've had the revelation of Jesus Christ for many chapters. Obviously, you've got to see who Jesus is. Watchman Nee used to say, there's two things you need to see. You need to see who Jesus is, and you need to see what the church is. And if, if you don't get to see what the church is, if you don't fully understand what the church is, you'll never fully understand your purpose in life. Because the church is what Jesus is building. The church is his bride. If you're a husband, the most important person in your life is your wife, not your kids. Did you get that, man? Your kids come from her. Yeah? It's important that we see that. Because if you lose the importance of the bride, everything unravels. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. We must never lose that. We've got to see it. And the angel says, I'm going to show it to you. Can you see it? And I think in this church, hopefully, we've got a picture of that because... We've talked about it so much. Okay, let's go back to the chart then. Revelation chapter 22. Now, we've not got here yet. But this is the sixth time the word nympha is mentioned in the New Testament. Okay? And it's mentioned... Oh, oh yeah, sorry, okay. Uh, it's mentioned in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. So let's go there. Revelation 22 and verse 17. So this is right at the end of the Bible. The spirit and the bride say come. And let the one who hears say come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. So now... This is at the end of eternity, the end of time, in the eternal state, the bride is now speaking. Yeah, there's only two people really speaking. Well, the bride and God, obviously the spirit, Jesus, God the Father himself. But it's the bride who's speaking to us from eternity future, telling us to come. Come and drink. And you will know that in the Bible especially the Old Testament, when a man wanted to find a wife, he went to a spring or a well. He went to a place of water, yeah? So where did Moses find his wife? At a well. Where did uh, Isaac find his wife, Rebecca? At a well. Where did Jacob find his wife, Rachel? At a well. When Jesus was looking for the woman of Samaria, where did he go to find her? At a well. It's a, it's a picture all the way through the Bible because that's where the bride is. She knows where the living water is. She knows where the Holy Spirit is. Remember, the living water, the water of life, Haim Mayim, Jesus says is the Holy Spirit within us. It's the picture of the Holy Spirit. Out of your innermost being will flow the river of living water. So the bride is not just the one who has come. The bride is the one who is always where the Holy Spirit is. And this is all the way through the Bible. Song of Songs. Let my, let the, you are a fountain, my sister, my bride. Let my living water flow. When Tamar, the, the people in 
um, Jesus' genealogy. Tamar was at a spring when she became the mother of the, the children of Judah. Yeah? It's, it's a picture all the way through. When they're at the spring, when they're at the well, even the one we've just ex 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 given an example of, which is not a good example, when David got Bathsheba, what was she doing? She was in water. Yeah? And that, that, they, uh, they committed sinful behavior, but God got them through it, and she became the mother of Solomon, yeah? So it's always the same picture, and over and over again, and it's the same picture. The bride is the one who is filled with the Holy Spirit, the living water, yeah? The bride is the one who is with Jesus, right? Now, physically, we're going to be taken to be with Jesus, but spiritually, you're with Jesus now, or you're not the bride, yeah? You know, when you belong to a, a, a man as a bride, you belong to him now. You're not just waiting for the wedding day. You already belong to him, yeah? So she's saying, come. And she speaks life because she already has it. And if you are part of his true church, the bride, you already have the life of God within you. It's not just something that's going to happen. It's something you already have. Sixth mention of the word nympha and we're at the end of the new testament now i don't like the number six but if you look in your concordance an english-speaking concordance the word bride only occurs six times now that's not good is it now if you've been following this study uh, the number six is not a number we like we like sevens because it's the number of something that belongs to God. It's the number of perfection. Now, I'll be honest with you. I, were, I only prepared this last week. And so I just assumed there'd be seven. <laughs> so I got my concordance out, looked up the word bride. It's like, and I knew most were in Revelation. In fact, I, I think I probably knew where they all were. I, I just thought, right, where's the other one? Where's the other one? Where's the other one? <laughs> so... There wasn't, it wasn't there. And so I, uh, I got my Greek lexicon out and looked there, and there were still only six. So I'm now reading it in the Greek, and there's only six. And so I thought, oh, well, I've, I've obviously made a mistake in my exegesis here. And then, I, so I sat there praying and thinking about it, nympha. And then I just suddenly, it just, either came to me or the Holy Spirit or in my memory, I just thought, hold on a minute. There is a nympha in the New Testament. But it's someone's name. It's not translated as bride. So let's go back to the chart. So I thought, all oh, right. It is mentioned seven times. But the seventh time... It's a time where it's not translated because it's literally someone's name with a capital N. So it's, it's in, in the list of nouns as proper names, which are obviously different. You'll, you'll not find them in. You have to look, look at that differently. So shall we have a look at that one then? Okay, let's go then to Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. You see, as I've said many times, God wrote the Bible. So this word, which is of essential importance, its priority can't be overemphasized. Obviously, God is showing us something here that you might miss. This is what we're going to look at a little bit tonight, because remember, the bride's always hidden. In, in, in Hebrew times, you hid the woman. No one was allowed to see her. She had to wear a veil. She was hidden until her husband revealed her. And this is the wonderful thing about the bride. It's always hidden somewhere. And so Paul's writing to the Colossians, and then at the end of the letter, he says, give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea. That's interesting, isn't it? Because that's one of the brides in Revelation that Jesus speaks to the final, the final age church. And to Nympha and the church at her house. Wow. Wow. She's called bride. She's at Laodicea. 
and the church meets at her house, not her husband's house. That has a lot more ramifications than you think. When you think of a time where women couldn't own property, for Paul to acknowledge just the name of the woman, most theologians, there's some that don't, because they don't like women getting any credit, but most theologians say she must have been the leader of the church. Because he only mentions her. Yeah? Some people struggle with that because they have other, you know, understanding of authority. I don't actually see any problem with it. It's certainly the church was at her house. So she certainly had some leadership and organizational responsibility for the church because um, when Paul writing, he says, greet her. Now, what's interesting is she's the leader of the church at Laodicea, which is the worst church. We looked at that last time when we looked at the letters to the churches of Laodicea. What does Jesus say to the church of Laodicea? He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm trying to get you. You won't let me in. Which is a direct parallel of the Song of Solomon where the bridegroom comes and knocks at the door and says, come away with me, my darling. But she isn't dressed and she doesn't want to get up. So even though he puts his hand through the latch and tries to grab her, he has to go away. And it says she then has to go through tribulation because she didn't get ready to meet with the bridegroom when he turned up. So Nympha is there. The bride is there, but it's mentioned in a metaphoric way. It's mentioned in a parabolic way. Because Nympha, which means bride, that's her name. It's a funny name to give a child. There's lots of theories because sometimes people change their names. Perhaps she wasn't called Nympha originally. Perhaps when she became a Christian, she understood the importance of what the bride was. So she changed her name to bride. Perhaps she didn't get married. Perhaps that's why she's the leader of this church. She certainly is meeting in her house. I mean, this is fascinating. You can study lots of theories about this. Have, have you ever noticed how important women's houses were in the Bible? Have you ever thought about that? Remember, in a time where women didn't own property, when Jesus wanted to stay somewhere, where did he go? Martha's house. Not Martha's husband's house. Martha's house. In fact, we don't know if she was married, and if she was, it never tells us who her husband is. Yeah? When Paul's starting the church, and he goes to people like Lydia's. Yeah? When Elisha needs somewhere to stay, he goes to the Shunammites. When Elijah needs someone to stay, he goes to the widow at Zarephath. And we just think, oh, because in our culture, that's not... I mean, it would still be a bit strange in our culture, but, you know, a single man going to stay at a woman's house. I mean, it's, that's, that would be frowned upon, wouldn't it? In, in that day and age, you could get stoned to death for it. But yet, God shows this all the way through the Bible. It's at Nympha's house, the church, the bride at Laodicea, the final church. And so you find it all the way through. Even in the book of Acts, you know, when Peter escaped from prison, where did he go? Mary's house, where they were praying for him. Not Mary's husband's house, the woman's house, the bride's house. Right? This is the, the bride at Royston. This is the bride at Royston's house. This is just a building. We're the bride. Yeah? So, Nympha is there, number seven. I'm pleased about that. And so, it's not six. There are seven Nymphas in the Bible because there's seven pictures of the bride because the Bible is a love story of Jesus getting his perfect bride. Okay, let's just go to the next slide then, please, Andrew. Let's just do a quick summary then of what's going on. Now, some of this we've already mentioned, but I just want us to uh, see this before we move on to what we're going to look at tonight. Okay, so this bride. Remember, the Bible is a story about God creating a bride. That's what starts in Genesis, and then she's finally completed in Revelation chapter 22, where we see her in all its fullness. So let's just go through these quickly then. Obviously, the bride is created. Yeah? God is not created. 
God is beyond creation. God is the creator. We are created, but we are created different to all of creation. The Eve was created not out of the dust, but out of the living organism of Adam who had God's breath in it. We're created in Christ when Christ died on the cross and he breathed out to tell a story that that word, uh, it is finished in Aramaic, which he was speaking, it's kala, which is also the word for bride. Okay, his side was opened up. We are in Christ. We belong to him. So the bride was created at the beginning of the Bible. She is unique. She is perfect. She is everything that God wanted for his son. That's who we are. God's perfect creation created for eternity. Okay, next thing. I mean, obviously, this is summarized you can read more detail this in my book she is separated from everything else right she was when she was created she was taken out of adam then separated from adam and then brought back to adam yeah he will be she will be born of my bone flesh of my flesh but for this reason she will be separated she will leave her father and mother you will leave this world you will leave this system and you will even leave your old husband Okay, Romans 7 verse 2, now that has different meanings, but it's biblical understanding, let's go there, Romans chapter 7 and verse 2, it's biblical understanding is that we were married to the old nature, to the sinful nature, we were married to the law that condemned us. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive, but if her husband dies, she's released from the law that binds her to him. Our husband, our bridegroom, Jesus, died for us. He died to take away the curse of the law, the curse of sin and death. And so in the same way, we die to ourselves so that we now can belong to Jesus. You see, legally, Jesus could not take you as his bride because you were married to this world. You chose that. You chose to do the things of this world. You chose to belong to the law of sin and death. Well, when you're married to someone, you can't marry someone else unless that's killed. Yeah? And so if you jump to, uh, is it verse 4? So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ. When Christ died, you died so that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. So now legally, you can legally be the bride because you are separated and you belong to Jesus Christ unless you still choose to love the world. Remember that. Just because you've got a perfect husband you can still reject him and go you give yourself to someone else. No, we're separated to belong to Jesus Christ. That's why the women in the Bible that are in the genealogy of Jesus were all widows, except Mary, who was a virgin. So in other words, they'd all been separated from their previous husband. Yeah, King David's wives were all widows. It's a, it's a prophetic picture of who the bride is we did belong to ourselves and the sin of this world we now belong to jesus christ yeah ruth tamar bathsheba rahab they were all widows but jesus chose them to be in his genealogy to belong to him yeah and the same with david's wives abigail Bathsheba, widows. Okay, we're separated from that to belong to Jesus Christ. Okay, next one then. Let's go back to the chart. We don't need to look at this in detail. You have been found by Jesus. He picked you. Yeah? That is a miracle. Jesus chose you to be his. Yeah? Now think about that. You don't marry, in our culture, you don't marry someone unless you pick them. Hopefully. Hopefully you did pick your bride. Hopefully you, you're glad about it. I'm glad about it. Hopefully you were pleased with that choice and that is what you chose. But the point is the whole Bible teaches this. All the brides had to be found. 
You think of every story of every bride, someone had to go find her. Where, where is she? She's got to be going found. She's in another country. She's by a well. She's over there. The book of Proverbs is about finding the perfect bride, the wife of noble character. Who can find? She's worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her. Jesus has full confidence in his bride. He doesn't just love you. He's chose you, but he's confident that you'll do what he's asked you to do. It's an amazing concept when you think about it. He found us. Now, here's another thing you know. All the way through the Bible, when the bride's found, the next one, she's barren. It's not an accident. It's done on purpose. All the women that God picks, right? Abraham had Sarah. She was barren. She couldn't have children. Isaac had Rebecca. She was barren. She couldn't have children. Jacob had Rachel. She was barren. She couldn't have children. And you can go on and on through the scriptures, even the ones we've just looked at. You know, the Shunammite couldn't have children. Hannah couldn't have children. Why is it that this is the case? Even in the New Testament, Elizabeth couldn't have children. Why is that? Because that's done on purpose so that God can show you that that which is born in you like a, woman, a child is born of woman, that which is born in you is done by a miracle of God. It's not natural. All the women in the Bible, I'll give you three examples there of the patriarchs, but there's lots more. When God picks you, he doesn't want you to just bear natural fruit. He wants to do a miracle in you. He wants to do the miracle through you so that when, the, when it happens, when you are fruitful, you give God all the glory because you know, I was barren, I couldn't do that. I did it because of a miracle God did inside of me. And when you know that's true, you see, these women knew it was God. So when Sarah gave birth to Isaac at nearly 100 years old, you know, she didn't give all glory to God as some like, twee statement she really went glory to god how did that happen she genuinely just went that was god there is no way i was able of doing that that's why they called him isaac laughter because when god told her she just laughed she just went yeah yeah you see my birth certificate yeah as if that can happen and that is done on purpose the bride is a miracle and everything she does is a miracle it's it's through um design purposeful design that god designs it that's the way that's why these uh, miraculous births happen all the way through the bible okay next one these are in not a uh, specific chronological order obviously you're purchased yeah in the bible you didn't just hook up with someone on the internet you had to pay the money, and brides were very expensive. You were so expensive that Jesus purchased you with his own blood. You were the most costly thing in the history of the universe. There's nothing been more costly than you. You are, you are literally priceless, yeah? And we've seen that. It's mentioned there in Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He gave his life for the church. But in Revelation, Revelation chapter 5 and other places, it says, these are your people who you purchased with your blood. Yeah? So you are purchased. God owns you. Yeah? If you read the story of Ruth, uh, when Ruth wants to marry Boaz, Boaz has to buy her. And she's very expensive. There's a lot of cost and cultural costs also uh, tied in with that. And the, the, the land costs, whoever gets the bride gets the land that she, her family is associated with. This is why Israel is such an important prophetic sign. It's not just that the people belong to God, it's that the land does as well. Yeah? So if, if, if I died and somebody wanted to marry my wife, who, who would not be my wife because I would be dead, First of all, they'd have to get all the kids' approval, which would never happen. <laughs> but then he would get the house, wouldn't he? Yeah. He'd get my, he'd get my house. <laughs> that ain't happening. That ain't happening. But obviously, 
she get, would get the house, so and then if she married another, if I died, and I'd have to be dead, <laughs> and I still might come back and have a word then, <laughs> he would get the inheritance, yeah? And this whole legal codes about this in the Law of Moses, Zeloha Fed's daughters, how they get their inheritance, which the inheritance didn't pass to the, 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 the daughters, the women. Yeah, in God's economy, it does, though. The bride gets the... That's why you'll find that phrase, what do you want, my bride, up to half my kingdom, occurs, Book of Esther, but even in the New Testament, um, because the bride gets these, the inheritance of everything. It's pretty good, isn't it? That's what our Saviour did for us, yeah? Next one. She's set apart all the way through the Scriptures. Whenever you read holiness, consecration... Yeah, Kodesh, these words, dedication, it, it often, it's all the same thing. It literally means you are sanctified wholly unto God. If you're the bride, you belong to him, nobody else. Yeah, and that's why Paul gets upset with the Corinthians there. We don't need to go there. I can quote it to you. He says, I espouse you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. How have you been deceived like Eve was? So that you're giving yourself to these other things. You're giving yourselves to idols. No, you belong to Jesus. You belong to him. You're his bride. And that's why Paul gets upset about them. You're holy. You belong to one husband, even Christ. And that's what we've just looked at with John the Baptist, saying the bride belongs to the bridegroom. No one else controls the church except Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit lives in the church, nobody else. Okay? And then uh, final one then for this overview of the bride um, she is going to get married, yeah. yeah, which we've just um, we've just looked at um, of the the coming wedding. She's getting ready. The bride is now belonging to Jesus at the end of eternity, at the end of Revelation. So, in the New Testament, at the end of the New Testament, the bride is faithful, and the bridegroom is faithful to the bride. It's interesting, you know. What's the last? Book of the Old Testament. Yeah. Malachi, the Italian prophet. <laughs> Ma Malachi. Malachi means my messenger. Just go there. Go to Malachi. Go to the Old Testament book of Malachi, chapter 2, verse 14. Chapter 2, verse 14. The last prophecy of the Old Testament, what's God rebuking his people for? Malachi chapter 2, verse 14. There we go. So God's rebuking his people, last prophecy of the Old Testament. You think of all the stuff God's people were doing wrong. In the, you know, they were doing a lot of stuff wrong. Well, what's really the main thing he talks about? He's saying, you're asking me why, why God's angry with them, why God's judgment is on them. It is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Just read the next couple of verses. You see, God's always clearly putting the emphasis on the most important thing. Has not God made you one? You belong to him in body and spirit, and what does the one God seek? Godly offspring, so be on your guard, and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who, the man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. God, even at the end of the Old Testament, places the emphasis on the protection and love of the bride. You can't miss it. Once you see this, you'll see it everywhere. Once you understand the importance of the bride, you'll see it everywhere. Because that's what God's emphasizing. Even at the end of the Old Testament, when he says, Behold, I'm sending the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord, before the coming of the Lord. That's why John the Baptist knew what his job was. He's got to protect the bride. 
got to make sure she's ready. And so that's what happens. So go back to the chart then. So the overview of the whole of revealed scriptures, and there's lots of other aspects to this, as I'm sure you understand, is that the bride from her creation to her marriage is going through this process and God is going to take you through exactly the same process. Whoever you are, God's going to separate you. He's found you. He's purchased you. You're going to be barren. He's going to do miracles in your life. He's going to keep setting you apart. He's going to test your fidelity. He's going to see whether you're going to be holy and consecrated to him because he's going to get you ready for the wedding. And in the Jewish wedding, once all this had been complete, the, the bridegroom would snatch away the bride and he would take her away, take her away to a seven-day wedding process. Even in, in modern history, it was called the fetching of the bride in Judaism. The, the bridegroom would go and fetch the bride once they were betrothed. And then there would be a ceremony at the father's house. And he would build a house for his bride, usually attached to his dad's house because of the, pro the, the family property and inheritance. Jesus said the same things. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. I will come back to take you to be where I am. Yeah? Going to build a house for us. And so that's an overview now of the bride. So hopefully we've mentioned this enough now and... You've read my book, so you understand enough about this, but it is going to keep being mentioned in the book of Revelation in the last two chapters. And so we're going to the wedding. Now, last time, we looked at what are called in the Bible the Moedim. Yeah? So can we put up the next, um, the next chart, please? If you remember... We looked at all the way through this study, but all the way through the Bible, God has told us very clearly, even right back at the beginning in Leviticus 23, he says, these are my feasts. Now, that word feast is moed, moedim plural. It means appointed times. God is saying, these are my appointed festivals. These are specific periods in time that you've got to be ready for. Yeah? And we've looked at how Jesus is going to fulfill all of these literally. Yeah? So he came during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He was the Passover lamb. He rose on the third day as first fruits. He's completed all those. And then at uh, seven weeks later, at the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came because it's harvest time. These feasts are around the harvest cycles. And then the three feast yet to be fulfilled by Jesus is the trumpet, the snatching away at the, at the last trumpet, the atonement, and then the return to dwell with man, literally tabernacle, yeah? When Jesus comes to dwell on earth, literally as king of the world, literally that word even in Greek, it's he dwelt among us, it's he tabernacled with us. And we, we've, we've looked at that, how those three final feasts, that what are called the autumn or fall feasts, are going to be fulfilled at Jesus' second coming in the end times. But then there's an extra feast that was added in the intertestamental period that Jesus celebrated in John chapter 10, the feast of dedication. And we looked at that, how once Jesus returns, he has to rededicate and cleanse everything. So all the feasts have sort of been fulfilled. But there's another feast that was added chronologically right at the end in the book of Esther. And that's what we're going to look at now. Because if all those feasts are symbols and pictures of literal events that are going to happen, or Jesus did make happen, then the final feast that we've not looked at yet is also going to happen. Yeah? Does that make sense? Now, these feasts, because they're prophetic, because when God does things prophetic, they, it all has a, a, what you could call a multifaceted fulfillment. Jesus fulfilled them literally or is going to fulfill them literally. You see, when we have feasts or festivals, we do it retrospectively to celebrate something, don't we? Christmas, Easter, they are looking back at events. And most public holidays follow that understanding. 
we look back at an event to remember and celebrate it. God doesn't do that. God looks forward to an event that hasn't happened yet so that we can celebrate it to get ready for it so that we know when it comes what it is. Now, the Jews should have known that at Passover when Jesus came. Behold, the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. They should have known all that, but somehow they, they missed it all. The Bible says they were blinded. But even in Revelation, these are prophetic fulfillments. Jesus is still called the Lamb in Revelation. The first fruits and resurrection still happening in, uh, in Revelation. The Holy Spirit who comes on the day of Pentecost is still there in Revelation. There's still lots of trumpets and atonement and tabernacles. God, in fact, even in Revelation 21, we've just mentioned God. It says God is going to dwell on earth with men. So there's still that fulfillment even in picture form all the way through the book of Revelation and uh, dedication as well. But what about the final feast. So let's go there then. Let's go to the book of Esther. The book of Esther, chapter 9, verse 28. Now to us, Esther, because it's in our Bible, it's before the book of Psalms, we can miss the chronology. Esther's right at the end chronologically of the Old Testament. It's in the time of the kings of Persia, the king of Xerxes, or Ahasuerus. Uh, she was his bride. And you know the story of the book of Esther. And so this is at the end of the book of Esther, where to commemorate what has been done in the book of Esther, they have the feast of Purim. Purim. Pur means lot. Purim just means lots. And so these days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family and in every province and every city, so this is for everyone to celebrate, and these days of Purim should never fail to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of these days die out among their descendants. One more verse. This is a summary. Obviously, the whole chapter is about this. So Queen Esther, daughter of Abihel, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter concerning Purim. And Mordecai sent the letters to all the Jews in the 127 provinces of Xerxes' kingdom, words of goodwill and assurance. Now, we'll not read, read uh, the rest of it. The understanding is there's this other feast that everyone's commanded to observe. But because it's done right at the end of the Old Testament, we never read about it again. It's just there. And so it's not mentioned again, but it's clearly there as the final feast. Now, without boring you with all the dates, it is literally right at the end of the Hebrew calendar. It's in the 12th month. So it's literally like the final of final of all feasts. Yeah? And what are all God's feasts? They are prophetic, moedim, appointed times that we are supposed to get ready for. We are supposed to do them, celebrate them. It's a shame we don't celebrate them, actually, in our own culture. Because the, uh, this week was Purim. So if you understand the Feast of Purim, you will know that in the Feast of Purim in, in Israel, everybody wears masks and they go and dance in the streets. And it's a very joyous celebration, but everybody has to be hidden behind masks. The Jews still do that today. In fact, I've got some friends who live in Jerusalem. They've been sending me their Purim pictures uh, this week of all everything covered up and in masks. Why is that? Because this is what the book of Esther is about. Now, the book of Esther is a weird book. And you might not really get that from its first, um, first reading. But there's some obvious things you will probably know in the book of Esther, right? God is never mentioned. Which, to be an inspired book in God's holy Bible, I, I mean, he's never mentioned. Never once. It's almost as if... No one believes he exists. 
the book of Esther, it's almost done uh, to mock atheism. If you think about the book of Esther, now, I hope I'm talking to people who've read it, but it's almost as if God doesn't exist, but yet God's will is still done. And everyone who tries to outwit God, even though God's never mentioned, they come a cropper. And everyone who belongs to God, even though it's not mentioned, succeeds and prospers. It's, it's, as I say, it's almost a, a mock of secularism. It's as if, you see, they lived in the kings of Persia. They'd come out of Babylon, where even the names there, Queen Esther and Mordecai, they are not Jewish names. They are the names of Babylonian and Persian gods. They renamed the Jews with the names of demons and idols. Mordecai is named after Marduk, the Mesopotamian god, king of the gods, some people refer to him. Ishtar was the Babylonian fertility goddess, the queen of heaven. Easter, you would actually pronounce it, funnily enough. It's funny how we call our celebration Easter, isn't it? Who thought up oh, that stupid name? <laughs> Babylonian fertility goddess, anyway. And so you've got this play on words all the way in Esther that you might not notice. Well, let me give you an example. So the, she's not actually called Esther, she's called Hadassah. But it's only mentioned, you're only told that once, and then the rest of the Bible. She's called Esther, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're not called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're Babylonian gods. They had Hebrew names. Esther, Esther, Ishtar, it's a play on words. Because whilst it is the name of a, a Mesopotamian fertility goddess, it's also... Go to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 22. Better to use an illustration of this. Daniel 2 and verse 22. God reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. God reveals hidden things. The Hebrew word for hidden is shtar. Right? She's called shtar. Right? Right? In Hebrew, you find this all the time. God's showing us a play on words. There's something hidden here. Can you see it? God will reveal the hidden things. But you've got to know that something is hidden. God hides things with the glory. It's the glory of kings to find things. It's, we've got to find things. Yeah? Esther is a book in which God hides things. And he expects us to find it. So much so that he's not even mentioned in it. But you have to find him. That's Even today, in the, in the Feast of Purim, they wear masks. There's nothing more hidden in the Bible than the glory of the bride. But you have to find her, because she's there. She's in every book of the Bible. And when you start to see her, you'll realize she's in every chapter of the Bible. She's everywhere. It's what God's aiming at in the final revelation. That's why the angel's saying, come, I'll, sh I'll finally show you what you should have known all along. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The bride is her husband's glory. It's what God's trying to show us in this final revelation. So even in the name, he's showing us that something is hidden. There's, there's another word uh, for hidden. It's, it's alam in Hebrew. Uh, which is another play on words, because the word for virgin is alma. It, it's, it's almost the identical word. It's just slightly switched round. The hidden treasure, the hidden virgin, the hidden bride. And so Purim, the final feast, there's a reason it's right at the end, and it's a reason so, that so many people don't understand it. It's because God is trying to show us what the bride is. And the book of Esther is one of the best examples of this. Because the book of Esther is, as I've said, it, it's a strange book. Let's go to the, let's just do a summary then of this Feast of Purim. Can we go to the chart, please? 
So Purim. Purim there mentioned in chapter 9. But let's go to chapter 1 of Esther. Chapter 1 of Esther. Um, go to verse 5. Okay. How does Esther start? Well, let's go there. Let's go to chapter 1 and verse 5. Book of Esther, chapter 1 and verse 5. When the days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the city. So everyone's invited to this amazing, this is the beginning of the book of Esther. Now, does seven days in a garden ring a bell? Has anyone heard of that before? <laughs> the, king, the, the king has... Seven days, and then he had... And it's not just a garden, it's an enclosed garden, the word paradiso. It's, it's the exact picture of paradise, the, the Garden of Eden. The book of Esther is the story of the bride in miniature. It's, it's basically a summary of the whole Bible. You should get that from the beginning, because it's about a, a, a garden celebration after seven days, Yeah. And God created the earth in six days, and then, then he, seventh day he rests, but at the end he says it's not good for man to be alone, so he has to what? He has to put a bride in the garden. Yeah? Well, that's exactly what happens in Esther. Right? This is exactly the same pattern that's being repeated here in the book of Esther. So jump to verse 10. So it describes the party in the garden, and there's all the wine, and everything's wonderful and lavish. By the way, there's secular... Uh, documentation that records this celebration of the king of Persia. And on the seventh day, when the king Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who serve him. And there's the names of all the eunuchs. I'll not go through all the names, but they all mean something. Who looks after the seven churches? The seven angels. The sevenfold spirit. So the king commands the seven servants, the seven angels, the seven eunuchs. Angel just means messenger. They were messengers. They were eunuchs. And he names them. We'll not go through them. Go to the next verse. To bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. Seven days, garden, sevenfold spirit, let's bring the bride. Let's bring the bride into the garden so that all creation can see the beauty of the bride. Yeah, That's exactly what the true king, the king of kings, was planning all along from the beginning in Genesis. This is the story of Esther. This is why it's here. So that's it. Everything's fine. It would be a short book if everything was fine. But that's not what happened. What happened? Next verse. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Typical. <laughs> Could have ended there and everything would have been great. Humanity could have had a glorious future in the Garden of Eden if only the woman didn't disobey what the king said. But she did. And so because she refused to come, the king became furious and burned with anger. And so he had a council meeting, and all the attendants said, right, because you told her to come into this garden and how to behave, and she did the opposite, she can never come into the garden again. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. That's exactly the same parallel as what happened in Genesis, because Esther is the story of the Bible in miniature. So what does the king do? Well, he sulks for a bit because he did quite like Vashti. But then he has to do something else, okay? He has to decide, does he still want a bride? Because if he does, he's got to get another one, because she's out. Embarrassing me in front of my mates. <laughs> she can't come. She's out the garden. And so she's banished from ever coming into the garden Again, okay, so what happens next? Well, he has to find a new bride. Yeah? So, if you go to chapter 2 of Esther, go to verse, uh, well, verse 2, the beginning. 
chapter 2, verse 2. So, these attendants of the king, the king's person, they propose, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. So let's find another bride. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. Eve disobeyed God. She was deceived. She fell into sin. Adam went with her. So now there's no bride. So God has to make another one. He's got to look for another one. That's you. You're the new bride of Jesus Christ. The first son of God, Adam, fell. The second son of God, Adam, uh, Jesus, didn't fall. The last Adam, Jesus, didn't fail. And neither is his bride going to fail. His bride is going to be perfect. So there is a search for a new bride. That's why all the way through the Bible, you will find God goes to find the right woman for the right man. Because it has to fulfill the prophetic pattern. But it's, it's the eunuchs, it's the seven attendants, it's the sevenfold spirit that is going throughout the earth, the Holy Spirit, to find the true church. But you've still got to come when you're called. The original one didn't. She says, I'm not going. I don't want to go to the garden. She wanted to stay with her own attendance, if you read chapter 1. And so we have to come. And so this quest for the bride takes place. Let's just read down. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all the beautiful young women to the harem of the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under care of Haggai, the king's eunuch. Who are the seven eunuchs? Seven angels, sevenfold spirit. It's God himself finding the perfect bride. The king's eunuch who is in charge of the women and let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the young, women who the young woman who pleases the queen, pleases the king, be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king and he followed it. So after the fall, the search is on for the new bride. Yeah? The quest for the bride. Does he find her. Yes. It's Hadassah, who is going to be renamed Esther. This is why the book of Esther is so important, because she's the picture of you. You're Esther. You're the one that's been found. You're the one Jesus has picked. You're the one who's not going to be deceived like Eve was deceived. You're the one who is going to be a chaste virgin unto Christ and not give yourself to other things. You're the one who is going to be made into this beautiful, perfect, spotless bride. Because that's what Jesus wants for you. And so this is what the, the Feast of Purim represents. It's the final Feast, it's what we are heading for. It's the final celebration, the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is what we're getting ready for. That's why Jesus was always looking for the woman. Think of the life of Jesus. He's always pick out the woman. You see that widow? She's doing more than everybody else. You see that persistent widow praying? She's praying more than anybody else. Because he had to find the woman. We have to go to Samaria. I've got to find the right woman to bring salvation to that town. It's all the way through, even in the book of Acts. But we haven't got time to look at that. Okay. So, next thing that we notice about Esther. I mean, there's, there's actually hundreds of things in the book of Esther. Just staying in chapter 2. Jump to verse 7. So, they find Esther. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah. That's very important because in, in those times and even today among Middle Eastern countries, you usually married your cousin. Yeah? If you, uh, I used to work in uh, a lot of communities from Pakistan when I worked in Leeds and, and Wakefield in these cities and they would often send for their cousins and they would marry their cousins because it was considered the right thing to do in their families. And, and they would do it, Jacob, uh, Isaac, Rebecca, similar situation. Now, Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah. Now, 
who he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter. Now, Mordecai is, is, is portrayed as a perfectly righteous man all the way through the Bible. But he doesn't take Esther as his own wife. But custom would have been you did. And she happens to be the most beautiful woman in the world. You could have talked me into that. <laughs> Not before I met you, sweetheart. <laughs> but surely it crossed his mind. But no, he, he, he's a picture of absolute righteousness. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. Yeah? And so Esther is found. Let's just read down. So she's beautiful. She's perfect. The king's order and edict had been proclaimed. Many young women were brought to the citadel at Susa and put under care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. So she is now brought in to the king's presence. Yeah, She now is sanctified to the king, but she's not given to him yet. That will come later. It's a picture of the church. It's a picture of the bride. But she's called, as we've just read there, she's called Hadassah, which is the Hebrew word for myrtle or myrtle tree. So what? Well, if you know your Bible, the myrtle trees are very important. Can we go to Zechariah, Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 8? Now, in the book of Revelation, everyone knows the four horsemen of the apocalypse, yeah? That's not the first time these horsemen are mentioned. Those, those horsemen are, fir, are, are mentioned in the book of Zechariah, hundreds of years before the book of Revelation is ever written. And during the night, this is Zechariah, I had a vision, and there before me was a man mounted on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in a ravine. Behind him were red, brown, and white horses. He sees the horsemen of the apocalypse. Apocalypse, apocalypto, is the removal of the veil. Let's just read down. I asked, what are these, my Lord? The angel was talking to me, answered, I will show you what they are. The man standing among the myrtle trees, Hadassah, the man standing among Hadassah, explained, they are the ones the Lord has sent to go throughout the earth. So without reading the whole passage, we know what the four horsemen of the apocalypse did. They brought destruction and devastation on the earth. So did these horses, so that everything was at war and devastation. But now the horses have stopped, and now he sees the myrtle trees. Once the horsemen of the apocalypse have carried out their destruction, hopefully you're going to see the myrtle. Remember, Esther is a hidden book. You've got to look for the signs and symbols in it. The myrtle tree. Zechariah sees that after the apocalypse, after the horsemen of the apocalypse, in fact, just read down, go to verse. Um, they reported to the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees, mentioned again. We have gone throughout the earth and found the whole world at rest and peace. So now after the four horsemen... There's going to be a time of rest and peace. But why myrtle? Why the myrtle trees? Why they're there? Remember, this is a vision. So it could have been any tree, couldn't it? He wasn't literally, he didn't literally see a myrtle tree. He saw a myrtle tree in a vision that God gave him. So God is showing him, you've got to understand the myrtle tree, or God wouldn't have mentioned the myrtle tree. I don't even know what a myrtle tree is. I think I used to have an anti myrtle once. <laughs> I, 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 I remember someone called Myrtle a long time ago, in my, you know. But I'm not quite sure what a Myrtle tree is. But he saw one. So for God to specifically show him that, it's the word Hadassah. Look. Hadassah. Look the Myrtle. It's hidden. But it's going to be brought forth after the four horsemen have done their job. After the apocalypse... Myrtle, peace, rest throughout the earth 
and the whole world. Again, just hints, but very specific hints. Can we go back to the chart then? So you'll see the book of Esther, which culminates in the Feast of Purim, which we're all moving towards, which is what God's going to bring about at the, uh, at the end of this age in the, uh, the eternal state. So let's just go down. We've just mentioned the first three, actually. So find the new bride. We've got here the hidden mystery, which is what the name star even means, hidden, as well as uh, Hadassah Myrtle. We're looking for the hidden things in the book of Esther. What's the next one? So once Esther is found, she has to go through a preparation process before she can come to the king. Yeah? Yeah. Let's go there then. Chapter 2 of Esther, verse 12. Esther chapter 2 and verse 12. So before a young woman's turn came to go to... Before, before she could go into the king, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments. Prescribed for the women. Six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and cosmetics. Before Esther can be brought into the king, she has to be made ready and beautiful. Yeah? That's what's happening to you now. The Holy Spirit, if you read it, it's the seven eunuchs doing this. It's the sevenfold spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. He is now making you beautiful, ready for Jesus. I know he's got his work cut out. <laughs> but that's what he's doing. He's washing you. What did John the Baptist do? He washed the bride. He baptized her so she was clean, so she was ready, so she was purified for the king. And it says there's two things, myrrh and perfume. Myrrh is always the symbol of death in the Bible. Right, we've mentioned that many times, so I don't need to go through it. They offered Jesus myrrh at his death. Myrrh was given him at his birth because he would have to atone for death. In the Song of Songs, it's the bride, her hands drip with myrrh. God will strip you of everything that kills you. You will go through a death process of preparation. Anything that is not of God in you, God will take away. And he will, he will take his time over it. It won't happen in one meeting. It will, t it will be a long process of God showing you no, no, washing you, washing you, washing you, and he will never tire of that because he wants you to be perfect, and he knows you're going to be. And so this goes on for six months, washed, and then the oil of perfumes and cosmetics, the holy incense of the Holy Spirit putting stuff into you. Yeah? It's the story of the bride. It's the story of the Bible. It's the story of Esther being prepared. Now, jump down to verse 15. What else does this, these eunuchs, the sevenfold process? What else does it uh, include? When the time came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai I had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go for the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, Picture of the Holy Spirit. Eunuchs are always important pictures. Who was in charge of the harem suggested, and Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. What does she, what does she use? She only uses the gifts that he gives her. She doesn't use her own things. She accepted only what he gave her. He asked her, what do you want? And she says, I want what you want to give me. Because he knew the king, you see. He says, I know what the king likes. Here's a bag of sausage rolls. <laughs> you take them. You take them into the king. You've made it, lass. He loves them. Now, it doesn't tell us what it was. Because I don't think it is... Once <laughs> no, it could be sausage rolls. No, she's Jewish, she wouldn't have took sausage rolls in. The point is, 
it, it's not what it is, it's that she was submissive to the gifts that he gave her, not what she wanted. That's the story of the Bible. Receive what he wants to give you, not what you think you should have. That might get you into trouble. Okay, so she goes through that preparation. Yeah? Okay, next one then. Let's go back to the chart. So not only is there all this stuff happening through a preparation, Esther now, when she goes into the king, he makes her queen. He says, oh, compared to the rest, I don't need, I, I just want Esther. She's perfect. So that's it. She's saved. She's in the harem. She's made it. You know, sadly, a lot of Christians get to that point and they think, well, that's it, isn't it? I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Doesn't matter what I do now. I'll just have a happy life and do what I want. No, that's not why you're there. Why is she there? She's been appointed there for such a time as this. Do not think you're just there to have the life of luxury you want. You're there to get something done. And so let's go to chapter 4. And we know the story. Let's go to chapter 4 and verse 12. We know the story. God's people have got a threat against them. And Esther would have probably thought, well, they're not going to do anything to me. That's what Western Christians are like, isn't it? Look at all the wars and terrible stuff that's happening. Yeah, but it's not affecting us. Really? Hmm. Well, it will. And you shouldn't have that attitude anyway. Whatever we do for the least of these, we do unto him. We should make sure him we help. So Esther says to Mordecai, there's nothing I can do. He sends back this message. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. Let's read down. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. God will save his bride. Don't you ever doubt that. But don't you ever think that you can do what you want. You are to play a part in that. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. The reason she was there was to save other people. The reason you're the bride is so that you can save other people. So that you can help other people. You know the story. She fasts. It doesn't say she prays. Remember, once again, Esther's a weird book. It's almost as if God's not there. It's as if all these people are operating in faith, but they never mention God. doesn't say they pray. It says she fasts. And she says, if I perish, I perish. And so she does the right thing. She seeks God. And what's happened at this time? A wicked man called Haman has taken control of basically the world. <laughs> certainly uh, Persia and its empire. And Haman is an Agagite. He's a, a, Agag was the king of the Amalekites, if that's where the, the name comes from. And th the Bible tells us they're always going to be trying to get you. The flesh, the carnality, the wickedness of this world. And so he erects... Now, your Bible will say he erects a gallows to kill God, Mordecai, God's righteous man on it but the hebrew is the word etz it's tree and so in in the book of esther it's all in the shadow of a tree the cross and everyone knows there's these gallows what are the what's that what's the what's that what's that tree out there for who's going to die on that tree and haman's saying we're going to kill god's man on it we're going to kill mordecai the guy who's in charge of the Jews, we're going to kill him. And that's what the story of Esther's about. Satan's plan is to get rid of Jesus and his bride. And so she has a job to do. But what happens after she's prayed and after they've done all these things that they can do? If you go to chapter 6... Now, I'm just giving an overview because we don't have much time. I'm going to finish with this. Go to chapter 6 and verse 10. This is before Esther reveals who she is. By the way, Mordecai tells Esther she can't reveal who she is. 
So no one knows who she really is. No one knows who the church really is. No one knows the glory of the church. The king doesn't even know she's Jewish. It's amazing how many people doesn't, don't even know Jesus is Jewish. He's the king of the Jews. We're grafted into his family. That's why the brides in Jesus' genealogy weren't Jewish. Because they're included in. Yeah? We're included in. Because we belong to Jesus. And so Haman goes to tell the king, uh, I want to kill God's man. I want to kill Mordecai, who's a picture of Christ. So what happens? He thinks he's going to win. And then the king says, first of all, before I answer what you wanted, go at once, the king commanded Haman, get, a, get the robe, the royal robe, and the horse, and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. What happens? Right in the middle of the story, when it looks like Haman's going to kill God's people, God's man appears on a horse, wearing a royal robe. And the, the man that they thought were being killed on the gallows is actually the one paraded through the streets riding a white horse as the greatest man in the empire. It's a direct picture of Jesus Christ. Revelation, what happens? God's man appears riding on a white horse, coming to save his people. That's exactly what happens in Esther. Way before, hundreds of years before the book of Revelation is written, God's give us an outline in principle of what he's going to do. So Haman, the Antichrist, sees control of the whole empire. He's going to wipe out God's people. He's going to destroy everything. And then right at the climax, when everything seems lost, the man on the white horse appears and the Jews are going to be saved. That's the story of Revelation. That's the story of the Bible. And what did the Jews refuse to do to Haman? Refuse to bow down to him. Haman says, you have to bow down to me or you will die. Mordecai says, I will not bow down to you. You're the Antichrist. I'm not bowing to you. Well, I'll kill you. Well, we'll see about that. And Haman, in his arrogance and pride, thought that he would get his own way done. But he didn't know that the bride was talking to the king. You see, this world doesn't know we have access to the throne room. This world thinks the church is weak. This, this world thinks the church has no power. We have access to ultimate power. Our bridegroom loves us more than life itself. He's going to give us whatever we ask. He's certainly going to save us. He's not going to let Antichrist take us. And if you know the story, when Haman does touch Esther, the king has him killed. How does he kill him? He hangs him on the very tree that he wanted to kill God's people on. What happened to Judas? He betrayed Jesus to put him on a tree, and Judas was the one who ended up suicide on the tree. Jesus is alive. And so this is what happens in the book of Esther. The honored rider appears, the Jewish savior comes, Esther reveals who she is. The bride is revealed. And so Esther ends with Purim. It ends with a feast and a banquet. So Esther starts with a banquet in the garden. Then there's a banquet of salvation where Esther pleads for the king for her life to be saved. Then there's another banquet. And then there's a final banquet. There's different banquets, different communion tables that represent our relationship with God, culminating in the ultimate one, which is the Feast of Purim, where all God's people are saved. And so in Revelation chapter 21, we are seeing that final revelation where Esther, when she inaugurated Purim, she stood up and she says, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Jewish lady, save my people. And so the king allows the Jews to protect themselves, and they are saved. So Purim is a direct picture of what we're seeing in Revelation chapter 21. 
Chapter 21 is the fulfillment of the final feast. It's the final communion. It's the marriage supper of the lamb where Esther puts on her royal robes and appears before the king and where the bride puts on her royal robes at the end of time in Revelation and she is revealed in all her beauty as the bride of Christ. Amen? Right, I think I've given you enough there to be thinking about.